in the end, that's where it's going. It's going out in the landfill. And God is saying that is an abomination. But that's what they were doing. And so the Lord is saying, we as human beings are on a completely different category than these animals. They are not redeemable. Human beings are redeemable. Okay? The unclean animals are redeemable, but only by another animal. There has to be an exchange. In the case of human beings, Jesus Christ was our redeemer. He did what we can't do. Okay? Do you see how the symbolism is coming together? People don't even read these things, and yet they all point to the greatness of Jesus Christ. Every word of it. It's easy to read it. Yeah, you just kind of... Because there's a lot of words, and it's a lot of information. It's like philosophy. You know, here that first couple weeks I was teaching philosophy. If you'd never heard that before, it was like, ah, I remember sitting in college because I'd never gone through that. And I'm listening, and I'm thinking, my brain's going to explode. It, it, really? But now it's as natural as, you know, water running downhill. It's just that you, you learn to think differently. Well, if you read this from the perspective of how does this point to Jesus, it starts to open up. And sometimes you need to discuss things. I learn things in here all the time because somebody brings up a point I had never thought of. And then it forces you to think it through or to go and check. I think the key is think. Think. That's right. Think. we got to keep thinking. We got to keep thinking. It's just like the 180 movie. I got to tell you, those people are standing there living their lives without ever thinking. They just listen to somebody say abortion is okay, and they say okay. And that's it. It's the end. They don't think any further than what's in front of them. But if you just give five minutes of time to somebody, five minutes, and you see the change in their life. I mean, it's a 30 minute movie, but they talk to six different people. They're no more than five five minutes for each person and yet they stand there and you could as I said the one blonde girl with the glasses on you can see her face going from kind of happy to so concerned her jaw is tight and you can see her glasses start her face is down where you can't even see anymore a little bit of thinking goes a long way in in our lives that's all it takes and the neo-nazi the neo he wasn't brought around but he was really thinking. Absolutely he was. He looked kind of scared. He really was. Have you got a Bible at home? Yes, I do. Well, maybe I'll read it. Unbelievable. What a difference in a person's you life. Cross means between your eyes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He had this little cross between his eyes, so he started... But I mean, it was Think it through. When I first started listening to that, I said, I thought this was a pro-life movie. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it funny? Yeah, the trauma had, yeah, the trauma had Hitler and, yeah. and, and you know, his... Oh, I mean, it was a All of a sudden, and here we go, Think just a little bit, a little bit, and it starts to open up. As it says, Psalm 119, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things from your word. And it's not easy. I mean, Joan, she, it, she's like, I don't understand. Are they going to kill the humans? It takes time and it takes real thought. And like I said, I read this 8, 10, 12 times before it even started to come clear. Because I didn't have any teacher. I didn't have anybody to learn from. There was, at the time, I think I might have had internet, but it was really infancy of the internet. 2000 or whatever, 2001. I don't know when the internet came out because I was never on it until. Yeah, oh yeah, when did Al Gore invent it? But all I know is I had an internet eventually, an email, but I didn't have anything else beyond that. I didn't. And it, it, this, is, this takes a lot of contemplation. The what? The ultimate teacher, time in the Lord. You know? He just absolutely. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, 14. 14, thank you. When the time to come, your son asked you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. But when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons So he's explaining explicitly now why he's doing this. I made myself glorious in the eyes of the world by what I did in Egypt. I took the firstborn, and so every firstborn, man and animal, must be redeemed or it must be, you know, whatever. Okay, as I said though, everything in the old is veiled, everything in the new is revealed. And so we know that this is pointing to Jesus. The Passover pointed to the ultimate Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Okay, everything in here, he gives you an explicit reason why, but it's not the full reason. There's more coming, okay? So, you can't just stay in the Old Testament the way the Jewish people do and say, this explains this. 
because it only points to something else. All right, it does explain it in the immediate, but not in the ultimate sense. Okay, please go ahead. It should be a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes. By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Okay, here's something spooky. Somebody turn to Revelation chapter 13. I know I said this in the Sunday class, but anyway. I, I, it took me, you know, the sixth or seventh time as I was reading through it, I said, look at this. And other people have come to this conclusion too, but I just got it, you know, just because, just because. Revelation 13, verse 16. Read that. And he requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. And that's exactly the same terminology used in 1316 of Exodus. So 1316 of Exodus, 1316 of Revelation. And once again, these numbers were not in the Bible until the year 1560. So it's one of your chiasms for the whole thing? Probably, probably in there. There's something that leads through the whole thing, pointing to this particular thing. But this is the sign of the covenant. This is the sign of the false covenant, right? 1316 and 1316. Unbelievable, you know, and is that chance? Well, it could be, but when you have hundreds, if not thousands of them in the Bible, it's no longer chance. It, 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 the chances, you know, it's like uh, eight prophecies of Jesus. I said that in that one sermon. If you were to fulfill only eight of the prophecies of Jesus, it would cover Texas two feet deep, the entire state. That's 270,000 square miles. It's like a trillions and billions and zillions of uh, of uh, silver dollars. And what you would have to do is to parachute into Texas and on your very first time without looking, pull out the one silver dollar that God has said. That's only eight prophecies about Jesus and there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. Even the most liberal scholars will say, yeah, there's about 50 or 60 of them that point to Jesus. The numbers are impossible. And just like this, one you have Oh, that's kind of coincidence, 1316 and 1316, but when you start adding up the times that this happens in there, Impossible. God's word is perfect. It is perfect. And when people stand there and they diminish it, boy, they're really just bringing, they're bringing judgment on themselves. And I'm talking about people in the church. I'm not talking about people that you know, are out of the church. They are already. But the people in the church that are so haughty and they say, well, we don't need to read this part. We don't need to read that part. And we can reject this. And you pull out one verse from this book and the thing starts unraveling. But it tells you that. Yeah, that's right. Don't, don't change anything. Jesus tells us not the slightest jot or tittle. Every bit of it is perfect. And yes, there are things that are hard to reconcile, and this text is different than this, and people are searching to get the, 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 the very, very, very original that we're at. I'm not going to deny that, that there are hard things to understand between the different texts. But when you take this as a whole and you look at the work that was done by this particular set of translators or that set of translators or whichever thing, when you read it, God has been with them and he has guided them. This is his word and he is not going to let it get out of control unless it is done purposely. New World Translation of the New Testament or of the, the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses, is a purposeful manipulation of Scripture. But even in there, you can lead people to Jesus if they will just, you know, if they will listen. So, anyway, and, you know, the Catholic Church has, before the time of uh, the King James Version, had numerous, numerous versions. Pope Quintus this and Sixtus that and all these, and you got the Geneva Bible. And you know what? The King James Version translator said, look at the difference between this version and this version, these translations within the Catholic Church. And they said, they're all the Word of God because these people were men of God and they had handled it, they had prayed about it. And just because something is translated differently does not make it null and void. If I give everybody here, and you all speak German, I give you a, a paragraph that long, are any of them going to be the same in translation? No, not one of them. Every single one of them is going to be different. I got it. Every one of them is going to be different. And there's nothing wrong with that. You are taking a something and you are translating it as best you can. And you speak perfect German. Not two of them would be the same. And that's only one paragraph. Of course you're going to have differences, but the Lord allowed that. He is still in control of his word, but he does allow differences. Okay, 17, please. Pharaoh let the people go. God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. 
For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Okay, he is uh, telling you here now, and uh, this is one of the reasons that is uh, explicitly given why he led them through the wilderness. He didn't take them directly up to Canaan. Here we are, we're leaving Egypt, and to go from Egypt to Israel is not a long journey. It's not a long journey at all, the way that they could have taken. There's already a highway, there's already, you know, they, uh, um, in uh, uh, Latin I think they call it the Via Maris, is that right, the way of the sea? Is it, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Via Maris. Anyway, it, there's this highway, it's an ancient, ancient highway, it's been there forever, and you can go right up from Egypt all the way up into wherever, and uh, uh, he is saying, you are going out as this giant group of people, and I'm not going to take you directly into the land of Canaan, because if I do, the Canaanites are not going to be friendly. They know that you're going to come in. They are going to defend what is already cities with walls. They've, they're already able to defend themselves, okay? You've got your wife. You've got your children. You've got all kinds of baggage. Are you going to be able to fight against these people? And the answer is no. Do they have any weapons? No. They're leaving Egypt with just the things that they have, plus what they plundered from the Egyptians. And God is saying, I'm taking you down this way. Plus, he already promised Moses, you will worship on this mountain. So he already had this lined up. But rather than taking them the quick way, he took them through the wilderness, and he tells why here. Okay. Now, this will bring up something, and I will tell you now, in case you missed this class when we get there. When they go in through the Red Sea, they're already through the Red Sea. And while they're in this particular area, not long after going through the Red Sea, Amalek comes against them. And Amalek is battling Israel, okay? And maybe you'll remember the account. Moses is told to hold his staff up, and as long as his staff is being held up, he prevails. But when he loses strength, they start losing, okay? So Aaron and, uh, what's his name? Uh, Aaron and Joshua hold up his arms. And I think it's Aaron and Joshua. I'm sorry, I don't remember that. I think Joshua's in the battle. Yeah, I think Joshua's in the battle, too. That's why Aaron and, anyway, somebody else, is, they're holding up his arms, and they prevail, Okay. This is before, I believe, and I may be wrong on this because I, I, I didn't study this beforehand, but this is before, I believe, they get to Mount Sinai. It's within that 50 days. It may be right afterward, but I think it's before they get to Mount Sinai. So it's right after coming out. And they're in a battle. Does that seem like a contradiction? He says, I'm not going to send you up there because uh, I, I, you're not going to go through the land of Canaan. Her. What's that? Her, thank you, her. Ah, I, I wish I could remember these things. Okay, so where did they suddenly get all of their weapons? Good girl. You know what, I questioned that. I was like, you know, I actually talked J.D. Rush. He, here, here's what happened. You know where you get this information? It's not in the Bible. Flavius Josephus. You go to just read it. You'll love it. It's very interesting. Okay, here's what happened. They are facing this destruction. They didn't have time to stop and mine ore and smelt it and, you know, make weapons. Where did they get their weapons? They're having a battle, right? And I'm thinking, boy, that doesn't sound right. And he, he came to one conclusion, and I said, that's not right. I emailed him or I called him. Maybe I emailed him, and then I called him later. And I said, you know, what you said wasn't right. And he came back and he says, well, Flavius Josephus says that all of the weapons washed up on the shore when the Egyptians, you know, they're spears and they got wooden handles and all that. And I remember he called me back after I said this and he says, that's the best. He said, that is the best phone call I've ever got. He wasn't home. I called and I said, it says, please leave a message. This is J.D. Grush. And I said, uh, I said, J.D., I said, this is Charlie Garrett. I repent in dust and ashes. <laughs> And he called back and he said, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. Because, I was, you know, I just had no idea. I'm thinking what he said didn't make any logical sense to me. And I didn't think it through. But history records outside of the Bible things that we need to know. And that's why there's nothing wrong with reading extra biblical books about these accounts. When we hold them on the level of scripture, then there is a problem with it. You don't want to do that. 
But if it explains something that is not specifically mentioned and you're thinking, well, where did these weapons come from? It's a wonderful, wonderful way of knowing this, okay? So anyway, I thought I'd tell you that in case we missed that, but we're going to get to the Red Sea and then we're going to get to this battle of Amalek. And uh, I wanted you to know in case you missed that class that it is reconcilable. These are the things that I go to bed not sleeping over until I can get them resolved. So I was, you're leaving. It's, um, we got, Mary's got five more minutes. We'll wait until Mary leaves.